And now, back to David Spada and Elliot Harris for more sports and torts on TalkZone.com. All righty. Next up, we have an interview with former Detroit Lion defensive back and occasional singer, Lem Barney. I see you went to Jackson State for college. I know Jackson State because a former Chicago Bear went there, Walter Payton. Sir Walter Payton, he certainly did, David. Uh, Pete, uh, I never had a chance to play with him, played all my years against Walter, but I had the opportunity to play one year with his brother, Eddie, who came up uh, my uh, senior year as a freshman. But, uh, yeah, the great sweetness, uh, played at Jackson State as well. I think Eddie's crazier than his brother was. <laughs> and you know what? The guy was a phenomenal golfer. Uh, I don't know why he didn't take it up. Uh, uh, he ended up becoming coach at Jackson State. He was a golf coach there for a number of years, but a fine golfer. Was Eddie as talkative back then as he is now? <laughs> More so back then than he is now, yes. I mean, he always had something to say. Uh, I mean, he always had the... Uh, Kibitz running around, he was always making people laugh. A great guy. I mean, you know, everybody appreciated him and uh, embraced him. And uh, in fact, I had a chance to play with him for a few years here with the Lions. He came over and played with me three, I think, three and a half, maybe four years for the Detroit Lions. But just a great guy. I see you went. To, I see you went to Jackson State. Were there other colleges that were recruiting you, or was it pretty much the smaller schools? Well, smaller schools particularly, uh, I, I, if, if uh, memory serves me well, I had a uh, offer from my most of the SWAC schools, uh, Texas Southern, Prairie View, uh, Grambling, uh, Southern University, uh, Alcorn State University, uh, none of the bigger schools, uh, uh, Big Ten or anything of that nature. Uh, it just wasn't that, uh, it, it wasn't that wide open at the time. Uh, I think it was... Guys like myself and Walter that got a lot of the uh, Big Ten schools and other uh, universities start looking down on that coastal area uh, for some great ball players coming out, particularly after guys like, you know, for, for Jackson State, particularly Walter and I and his brother, and uh, from around the area, Willie Richardson, who played with the uh, Baltimore coach, Gloucester Richardson, who played with Kansas City, and then Thomas Richardson was a roommate of mine at Jackson State and played with the Boston Patriots. So, uh, well, uh, yeah, Boston. They weren't New England, and they were Boston Patriots at the time. But a lot of the small uh, uh, African-American high schools wasn't getting uh, the big offers at that time. But uh, the eyes were open uh, later on, particularly after Walter came out of a, a small school there in Mississippi. How do you turn down Eddie Robinson and Grambling University? Well, you'd have to be uh, on some type of uh, medication. <laughs> uh, Eddie, <laughs> you'd have to be on some type of ed- medication. But, I mean, Eddie, what a great guy. I mean, I, uh, as I look back on my collegiate career, my my only non-winning school against was Gramlin. Gramlin beat me four years in a row, uh, twice down in uh, Gramlin and then twice at Jackson State. Uh, Eddie was just a phenomenal uh, head coach, a great communicator. Uh, he was a father figure. In fact, a lot of people don't know the ins and outs about Eddie. Eddie was a guy that was uh, a one-man uh, scenario down at Grambling. He would tape ankles. He did the very few checks every night. Uh, he made sure the guys were eating right, going to class. I mean, just a tremendous guy and had a great friend over in Alabama, Papa Bear Bryant, uh, and I mean, it was just amazing, particularly because of the uh, scenario that was going around, and the racial tension was pretty much high in the early 60s, and Eddie and uh, the lead great bear, uh, Bryant, were, were dynamic friends. Uh, they worked together in camps during the off season, and uh, I mean, what, what else can you say about him? I mean, just a tremendously great coach. So... Eddie Robinson had to kind of be upset when they lifted the quotas on the college teams with how many black players could be on there because it was hurting them because he was just stocked. Absolutely. He had to give a lot of his uh, ball players away to a lot of the Texas colleges, Texas Southern University, TSU, and then there was Prairie View in Texas and uh, some other smaller schools. 
But uh, Eddie was just a dynamic uh, recruiter. I mean, guys from from Detroit, I mean, across the country, Los Angeles wanted to play down at Grambling because everybody knew the one, two, threes, the ABCs, and the XYZs of the great uh, Eddie Robinson, just a phenomenal coach. And then you get drafted in the second round by the Detroit Lions in uh, 1967. What was that adjustment like going from Mississippi to Motown? Well, it was uh, <laughs> it was one of those things that you just had to uh, continue to do the things that you were doing to get you get you to get there. Uh, that's what Coach said. I said, well, "Mal, I'm going to Detroit." He said, "Just keep doing what you've been doing, and you'll be fine." Uh, I had a, a tremendous, uh, great head coach. Uh, my uh, first. My my last three years in college, my first year it was under the head coach of uh, a late guy that came out of uh, out of Atlanta, and then Roderick Page. Uh, you remember Rod Page? Rod mm-hmm. Page was a yeah. Rod Page was a great coach as well, uh, and uh, I got a chance to start under uh, Coach Page as a defensive back. I went to Jackson State as a quarterback. A lot of people never knew that, and I thought that uh, because of uh, John. Don Meredith from uh, Tennessee State. He recruited me out of uh, 33rd Avenue High School my senior year and said, boy, you're going to have a chance to play. But he had a great quarterback there then by the name of Roy Curry, who ended up playing with the Chicago Bears. Uh, they didn't give uh, Roy an opportunity to uh, play quarterback. They put him out at wide receiver, uh, a big quarterback, too. I think Curry was about 6'4 and weighed about 225. And threw a ball to a gentleman that should have been a uh, Hall of Famer if he'd have uh, had the opportunity to be down in Miami to play like he did at Jackson State. Willie Richardson was one of the Richardson uh, brothers. There were three of them that ended up playing at Jackson State. But uh, Roy Curry was a fine quarterback. And uh, Leslie Duncan, uh, who played with the San Diego Church Chargers. Verlin Biggs, who played with the New York uh, Jets. And uh, Frank Molden, who played with the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers and uh, with Philly, we just had a a bevy of great guys. Uh, Taff Reed, who played in the league as well, we just had. I mean, it was just a, an abundance amount of uh, talent down in those African American schools during those times in the '60s. And your coach early on in your career with the Lions was Hall of Famer Joe Schmidt, right? Absolutely, I played my uh, first uh, seven years under the great. Uh, Joe Schmidt, uh, and it was ironically, as I looked at my career, uh, afterwards I ended up playing, uh, I played uh, under seven seven head coaches, uh, <laughs> seven head coaches in 11 years, and I played my first seven years with, uh, as you just mentioned, the great Hall of Famer uh, middle linebacker, Joe Schmidt, and then I played uh, for Rick Frazano. Uh, well, before Rick Frazano, it was... Uh, Don McCafferty, uh, easy rider, who we got from the Baltimore coach. Uh, Don was a great coach, and uh, Don died his second year in training camp. And then Rick Trezano from Navy, who coached the uh, great Roger Staubach at Navy, took over under uh, after uh, McCafferty. And then from uh, Trezano, it was uh, uh, Tommy Hutspit. And then from after Tommy Hutspit, it was uh, Monty Clark who played for the uh, Cleveland Cleveland uh, Cleveland team, and so I had five head coaches in a, a span of eleven years. But had a great time with all the coaches. Always respected the coaches. Coaches were like parents. I was always taught by mom and dad, so you had to learn to respect coaches. How easy was the transition from college to pros for you? I mean, you end up winning the Defensive Rookie of the Year in '67. So it couldn't have been all that difficult, but at what point did you say, you know, I, I, I can do this for, for a living? Yeah. And that, that was the ideology about it as well. Uh, the, the training was the, the key to my whole success from middle school through high school and uh, college and then to the league, uh, working hard, training, and my method of working out uh, my uh, sophomore year in college, I started the uh, mile and a half. At backpedaling prior to uh, training camp, I uh, worked out all the way during uh, during the off season. But when I started backpedaling, when I found out that I was going to be a defensive back and not a quarterback, I started running backwards 
for training. And uh, people used to see me down on the coastline from Gulfport, uh, about 187 miles from Jackson, and uh, would run down to the beach, and I'd run like a mile and a half forward, and then I'd run like two and a half miles backwards in the sand. And you try doing that, I mean, people thought I was crazy. And for a long time, I thought I was crazy as well. <laughs> But but what that did was that actually it's like a sprinter. You find a great sprinter like Bob Hayes or Jane Sides or any of those great sprinters. All they practice is doing is getting out of the blocks low as they can, as fast as they can, for 15 to 20 yards, and they'll start rising up. So as a defensive back, to become a good defensive back, I started training, running backwards in the sand. And, I mean, it was tough. I mean, it was tough. And a lot of people, I would uh, – I say with good athletes could never buy into that theory. But, I mean, it, it, it was my key to being as successful as I was as a defensive back from uh, played it in high school and then at college and then in the league, as you mentioned, for 11 years. But it was always a joy because you had to learn and teach and train those muscles as a sprinter going forward. You had to do it going backwards. As a defensive back, they don't realize you're employing yourself in a backpedaling position for over 93% to 95% of the time. You know, you stop and come forward, you'll make a tackle, but most of your activity is moving backwards. So the more you can train and adapt your muscles to moving backwards, uh, the better you'll be. And so I, I, I did that for my entire career. You had some uh, good teaching being playing defense with the Lions and your uh, defensive coordinator, Mr. David. He was a, what, six-time Pro Bowler, and he guys he ran your defense well. Absolutely. Uh, that's what they call it. <laughs> and, I mean, it was just a joy. It was like uh, the Lord had placed angels on me all of my, uh, over my entire career. Uh, you're right. Uh, Jimmy David, the hatchet, as they called him, uh, was just a tremendously great teacher. He wasn't only a great defensive back. He should be in the Hall of Fame, as you mentioned, six Pro Bowls. And uh, he should have been there with another teammate that played with him, Yale Larry, who played for the Lions. But Jimmy was a tremendously great coach and uh, he, he wasn't one of those guys like you see today most guys today that are defensive coordinators or defensive back coaches come up to because of their head coach was a friend of theirs in college or they were cronies in college or something of that nature and just there because they they're, they were friends of the head coaches but even though joe and jimmy played together coach joe schmidt knew that jimmy david could coach because he played the game with that same type of intensity. Well, you and Jim David obviously must have had some sort of special bond because when you go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, he's the guy presenting you. Yes, he was. I mean, I had a uh, couple of people that I thought about, uh, but because of the training and the confidence and the courage that Jimmy David gave me to play that game, uh, it was just uh, unbelievable. We had a uh, a love a, a love relationship that and and I still call his wife and uh, speak with her from time to time and his kids. Uh, but Jimmy was just a, a tremendously great uh, asset for me and to me as a Detroit Lions Pro Football Hall of Famer. And uh, he was just uh, so great. I mean, you know, again, as I said. Joe, who played the game, he could coach the game. Uh, Jimmy, who played the game, could coach the game. And uh, it was almost like the Lord had angels on me from my middle school years all the way up through my professional years. Um, and uh, I will always be uh, appreciative of that. Uh, my high school coach, who was a running back at Alcorn State University, was an All-American named Robert Hall told me if I wanted to play defensive back or quarterback or wide receiver, I could do it and do it with uh, uh, a bit of ease. But, I mean, nothing was easy about it. It was always uh, a dire hard work effort. Uh, I never was a guy that would loathe doing practice or doing training. Uh, you see a lot of guys that kick it around during the course of uh, practice. They'll do the same thing in, in a game. I mean, your body just adapts to what you do for it. And so... It was always with intensity. In fact, I can remember Coach Smith telling me on offensive day, he said, Lem, let the guys catch the ball. You know, this is the offensive picture. I said, Coach, 
if you want to catch it, you need to put, put somebody else over here. I'm not going to let them catch it. i got to give them a game picture. And, I mean, it made everybody play better, uh, not only in practice but also in the game because what you do in practice is normally the way your body is adapted to doing things during the course of your practices. So I would tell him, and, I mean, I wasn't being smart or anything, and he, we laugh about it now, but he said, you're right about it, man. If you do slow up in practice, your body will take that uh, initiative to slow up during the course of the game. And so it was always right for a rudder full speed ahead for me. And Jimmy David agreed with it. Uh, he was that way in practice. He would sit down and tell me that. He said, they called me the hatchet because I would whack him in practice. <laughs> and then once I got in the game, it was easy to do. But I really enjoyed practice. I was a gentleman and enjoyed the practice sessions and the particular reason for that is because of my training before going into practice was always there. And one of the great things that I learned, loved about the professional aspect of playing the game was being able to study film. Uh, we really didn't have the film in college. Uh, we didn't have the means for it. We would see film, but, I mean, they wouldn't break it down like it was in the professional aspect of it, uh, first and tens, everything uh, team did the last five games before if I'm playing the Chicago Bears this upcoming week, I would have the opportunity to get the last five games of the Bears on film. And so how you break down film is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a tedious job. It's, it's hard work. Uh, but everything that you would do as a Bear getting ready to play me, the Lions, the next week, the five ball games before we play each other is that what you did on first and ten second and short, third and short, third and long, midfield, short yardage and goal line that was successful in the last five ball games, I pretty much could put a dial on the table that you're going to do the same thing in the next game against me. So learning how to break down film was uh, was one of the great assets for me that was taught and trained to me by uh, the late great Jimmy David. What a great guy he was. I'll tell you what, you aren't only a great – football player you were a singer what is it with the detroit lions you guys had a lot of entertainers on your team yourself <laughs> alex karras turned into an actor <laughs> i had mel far also with us on the uh what's going on uh, album with marvin gay uh i think mel and i could be uh could have could be a plane of being the only two nfl stars to uh have a gold record as well and, and it came about uh Marvin was uh, one of my favorites when I was in high school. I mean, he had to be everybody's favorite, but I mean, uh, when I found out I was being drafted by the Detroit Long Lions, I said Motown. That was the first thing that came to my mind was Motown. And uh, Motown was at its pinnacle in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, Marvin Gaye, the Temptations, the uh, Miracles, the Four Tops, uh, the Lady Singers, the Supreme. So, when I, when I was in training camp, I said I wanted to go by and meet Marvin Gaye one day after practice. And I got a chance because I found out where he played golf, a public golf course over here named Palmer Park. And everybody said, well, he plays golf here. So after, after the morning practice, I missed lunch, and I drove off to Palmer Park to look for Marvin Gaye. And uh, everybody said, no, he's not out here now, but he doesn't live that far. So they told me where he lived, and I drove around, and I go over in these games. Got a big brown Broham Cadillac. That was the marker for me. He drives a big brown Broham Cadillac. So I see the Cadillac, and I pull in the driveway, and I go up, and I ring the bell, and I step back, and the bell had a chime to it, a little musical chime. About twenty, about 25 seconds, I was getting ready to hit it again, and the door opened, and who stood in the door but Marvin Gaye? He said, yeah, man, what's going on? I said, look, Marvin, my name is Lynn Barney uh, with the Detroit Lions. I just wanted to come by and tell you, what a great musician I think you are. He said, who'd you say you were? I said, Lem Barney. He said, not the guy that played with the Detroit Lions. I said, yes, sir. He said, man, you're too small to be that guy. I said, you want to see, I said, you want to see my driver's license? He said, no, man, come on in, man. I was having lunch, you know. So I go in, and he's in the kitchen having lunch. I said, no, I'm okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, training camp and have lunch before the second practice. And he said, man, what, what's your OBS? I said, well, I just wanted to come by and just – meet you and tell you how much I appreciate your singing and everything, man. And so, anyway, man, the, the kibitzing got to going, and I look at my watch and say, oh, man, I got about 30 minutes to be on the field, man. And it was about 25 miles from where he was, and I was driving, and, I mean, I was 
driving like Mario Andretti and just hoping the cops wouldn't find me, and they didn't. And I get back, <laughs> I get back to training camp. I got just enough time to put on my uniform, and still today nobody knew it because I'd have got fined for it. I didn't get my ankle taped that day uh, for the second practice because I was a little late and everybody was gone. But, I mean, it started a uh, dynamic uh, relationship between Marvin and I. And I told Mel about it, and uh, he said, Oh, man, that's wonderful, man. we got we got to go back by and see him again. So we started visiting Marvin afterwards. He was getting tickets for him and uh, Smokey. They would meet us down at Tiger Stadium, and then we'd have a special place. The Lions would go eat after a home game at Tiger Stadium. And Marvin and Smokey started coming by, and everybody, you know, everybody quite naturally going to love these guys. And so they would eat with us and have fun. they take the piano over, and I mean, it was sing along, not to sing along with Mitch, but sing along with Marvin and Smokey, and uh, the bond began in there, and I mean, just a wonderful guy both of these guys are. I still stay in contact with Smokey, and uh, just, just a great guy, and then Marvin had an opportunity, he, he said, I, we'd always go by the studio and listen to him recording, listen to him singing, and one day he took Mel and I by there and uh, set us in the music room with him, he said, Lim, you take this part, Mel, no, you take this part. What? So, yeah. So, the next time you listen to what's going on, you can hear a voice that come on. And then I say, Say, brother, what's happening? I say, Yeah, brother, like solid, right on. We do the dwee, we do the dwee, mother, mother. And as a result of <laughs> being a gold record, so quite naturally, he gave us a gold record. For, well, my, well Barry, 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 Barry Gardy did, the big guy for Motown. Gave us a gold record uh, for singing back I grind with Marvin on what's going on. And so it's been a joy. What a great guy he was. Do you still get the residual checks from that song? <laughs> what the residual paid? I'll tell you what, I, I, would, I, would pay, I would pay Motown to get just to have the gold record, man. No, wasn't no residuals coming. But, I mean, it was just a joy to, you know, sing with a guy that you fell in love with and uh, he became great friends. And uh, what a what a dynamic guy he was. I mean, a lot of people didn't really know the ins and outs about Marvin, but he would give you the coat off of his back and wouldn't ask you for a receipt or a dollar for it. He just had a compassionate, loving heart. and He always wanted to uh, be an athlete. Um, just, didn't have, just didn't have it. I got Marvin a shot with the Detroit Lions as a, uh, as a walk-on. And Joe Smith would uh, listen to uh, people like he would on. The uh, Shirley Eater show. He was with. Uh, he was on uh, Jack Parr show and a lot of the shows around the Detroit area radio and TV. I'm gonna be a Detroit Lion. And so Coach Smith, uh, what's this about your name? Marvin and says he's gonna be a Detroit Lion. Don't you know he have to check with him? I said, Coach, I keep telling him that he can't just you know walk on. He, even if he's a walk on, he has to get the permission from the team. And so Coach had me to set up a meeting where Marvin would come down to the office and talk with him uh, because he knew him. Marvin would be over at the uh, restaurant where all the coaches and the wives and the players and the wives would be uh, Sunday nights after a game at Tiger Stadium. And Coach asked Marvin, he said, Marvin, you have any film from when you played in high school? Marvin sort of held his head down and said, well, Coach, I never played in high school. He said, well, it's okay. He said, what about college? Do you have any film on you from when you played in college? He held his head down again and said, Coach, I never played in college. She said, well, Coach, well, Marvin, what makes you think you can walk on as a professional without having played in high school? And he said, Coach, I just believe in my heart. The first time I touch a pass, I, I score a touchdown. You know, any time I touch, I, I just believe that in my heart. Coach said, Marvin, I love your attitude and everything, but uh, let me think about that. I'll get back with Lim and I'll let you know. So <laughs> Coach called me back that evening and said, now, I want this guy to come out there and get a leg broke, something I couldn't live with myself if I did. He said, but let me think of something. I'll get back with you. So Coach had a three-day uh, shoes and shorts and, and helmets at work, work out up in Flint, and he invited Mike Marvin to come on. And Marvin tried out a running back, a tight end, and a wide receiver. But he had the he had the heart for it, but he just didn't have the skills skills or the talent for it. But he was, he was appreciative that coach gave him an opportunity at least to uh, work out with guys. We talked to Joe Schmidt last year, and he said the toughest thing he had to do when he was coaching was when Chuck Chuck Hughes died on the field, basically arranging his funeral, doing everything like that, and that basically soured him on him on football. 
Yeah, I think the, the entire squad, not only the squad, the organization, not only the organization, but the town and the state was uh, pretty much uh, balled out behind that. Uh, a lot of people thought Dick had hit him, uh, but because we were playing the Bears uh, at uh, Tiger Stadium. And the week before, a lot of people don't know the ins and outs of the uh, start to this. The week before playing the Bears, we were playing the... Uh, New England Patriots in Foxborough, and, and uh, Chuck kept running a few patterns, and he came back, and he sat on the bench, and he had a PVC, a premature ventricular contraction, that just shook his heart so bad, knocked him off the bench backwards about five yards, and uh, the next week, he just started, you know, when he came back from uh, New England, he started going through the hospital, through doctors, and they was checking him out every day, twice and three times a day, and found out that he, he had just a little, like I say, just a PVC, a premature ventricular extraction, and they showed no other scars or anything, and they thought he was okay. And uh, the next week, we, we were playing the Chicago Bears here at Tiger Stadium, and uh, Chuck came in uh, on the first and ten and uh, ran a pass route, and the ball wasn't thrown to him. As he was coming back to the huddle, he gets another pass call, and he runs another route out, and the ball wasn't thrown to him. And on his way back, as he's passing the Chicago Bears huddle to get 10 yards back where the Lions was huddling, he fell between the ball and where the Detroit Lions were huddling. So it was foaming at the mouth, and, I mean, it was just a horrible sight. And uh, Butker started waving, because during those years at Tiger Stadium, both the teams were on the same side of the field. It wasn't like, you know, you've got the new stadiums where one side, one team is on one side, one's on the other side at Detroit. And I think all of the uh, Central Division teams did that, stayed on the same side, both 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 squads. And uh, Butkus was waving for some of the doctor's physicians to come by, and people thought Butkus was taunting Chuck because they thought he'd slipped. And hurt himself, but Butkus was actually summoning the doctors from the Detroit Lions, and finally, when they got out, they saw how his coloration had really changed, and they rushed him off the field uh, down to the hospital. But uh, uh, they couldn't do anything. They, the key was that he transitioned, he made his transition to death uh, before they even took him off the field. It was that strong uh, a PDC this time. and. Uh, as a result, we all went over. We flew down to uh, Austin, Texas, where uh, we funeralized Chuck. And one of the greatest things about him, I love the guy ever since then. Always had great respect for him, but I fell in love with him when he called the Lions and asked if he could go down on the flight with us to the funeral. And that was the great Dick Butkus, and I've always uh, admired Dick for that. I have a great relationship with him. In addition to your singing skills, you also were an actor of some note. <laughs> What, one of your roles was playing Lem Barney in Paper Lion. How tough was that? <laughs> I love George Flimpton and Alan Alder. <laughs> yeah, that led to another uh, trial, too, but the uh, first role as a movie uh, star was uh, in the Paper Lion that was written by George Flimpton, a great writer. Uh, George always wanted to uh, play, uh, get a shot at playing professional ball. George was a tall guy, uh, wanted to play wide receiver. In fact, it, he got the Lions and Coach Joe Schmidt to give him an opportunity to uh, play in a preseason game, and he played up in uh, played up in University of Michigan uh, in a preseason game. And uh, as a result, uh, from that, he wrote the book, The Paper Lion, which became a bestseller. And then after that, it had so much noise and attention around the country about uh, a writer, you know, trying out with the Lions, and it was. Uh, as as it was, we, we we got the big guy from from Mash, <laughs> Alan and Alder, to play the role of George Flampton, and uh, it was just so much fun doing it. We did it down in uh, Florida at Boca Raton uh, uh, Private Boys School, where we filmed it, and uh, it came out being a great uh, a great film. Uh, and uh, we went over to uh, St. Louis, Mike Weger and Alex Karras and myself. Mike and I did a lot of singing. In the, uh, in, in, in the in the movie, uh, they did a lot of the training camps and what rookies have to end up doing during the uh, course of uh, 
indoctrination as a professional ball player during uh, your rookie year. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And uh, it was a big uh, big blowout over in uh, St. Louis where we did the premiere showing and uh, went around the country that way. And uh, I don't know if you knew I had uh, two movie experiences. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Was <laughs> didn't hit as big as <laughs> the Faith of the Lion, but uh, after that, uh, we we were approached by uh, a guy who had done the uh, biggest thing that he had done was Linda Lovelace Deep Throat. You remember that movie? Yes. Yes, Deep Throat. Okay. <laughs> well, well, the guy who the guy <laughs> he's off the side of the the guy who did the uh, uh, Linda Lovelace Deep Throat contacted Carl Eller from the Vikings. Joe Green from the Steelers, Willie Lanier from the Chiefs, Mercury Morris from the Dolphins, Gene Washington from the 49ers, and myself about doing a motorcycle movie called The Black Six. Um, and, and the movie comes out to saying that we were all Vietnam, Vietnam War veterans. And while we were in Vietnam, the six of us, we had bonded the pact that if we survived the Vietnamese War, we would come back to the States and buy motorcycles and just ride all across the country riding our motorcycles and enjoying life. And our motto was, we would show love and peace, no hassle. That was our motto. But everywhere we went, we ended up uh, running into dangerous uh, troubles <laughs> across the country. How did you have enough script for Mercury Morris? Because I think he would take over the film because he loves to talk. <laughs> he had it. He had it all too. <laughs> what a great guy, Mike. What a great guy, I tell you. We we had a great time with that. It it didn't it didn't strike uh it didn't strike the audience as, as well as it did, uh we did with the uh with the uh paper lion, but uh it was fun. We had a good time with it. So who was the best cornerback in Paper Lion, yourself or Night Train Lane? Night Train Lane, no question, man. The train, what a great guy, man. His soul rest in peace. Uh Train helped to scout me during my uh, junior and senior year down at Jackson State. Uh, I thought it was an honor to have him to come down with Dick Knight Train Lane, uh, the largest cornerback on record in the NFL uh, still to date. As uh, modernized as the game is now with all the defenses, he still has the all-time league-leading record as a rookie, 14 interceptions. And they were only playing 12 league games at the time, and it's four more games now. So, uh, Dick Knight train lane, what a great guy. Left-hander, too. He played on the left side, and he was left-handed. And uh, trained, for, for whatever reason, <laughs> coach couldn't figure it out either. When a sweep would occur, cornerback's responsibility is to come up and go on the outside shoulder of the pulling lineman to turn everything back in for the pursuit to make the tackle. But Train would not turn it in. He would go inside and turn it out. And the reason for that, Night Train was left-handed. And Train would hit you with that meat hook. He would hit you around the neck. It was like a clothesline tackle around your neck. And when the guy who was running the ball and thought he was outside of Dick Night Train's grass, when they would wake him up, the official would be over him. And they said, what happened? The official said, the train got you, baby. The train got you. <laughs> But that train, he was just a great guy. Uh, the biggest corner on record, as I mentioned. Now, the first game you started at defensive back, the first pass comes your way. You intercepted off part Sorry, Is that the one interception that stands out to you in your career, or, or is there one? Uh, you know, uh, 56, uh, I, I could almost uh, re reiterate and uh, describe all of them. I still remember them fondly. But but the first one was uh, it was so special uh, merely because of the fact of the matter I I, I had, had a great admiration for Bart Starr and I still do and in fact I called Bart the uh, a couple of days after his son uh, uh, committed suicide uh, great guy Bart and I became very good friends and uh, again I had a tremendous respect for Bart because again I wanted to be a Bart Starr uh, Bart was quarterback and uh, over in Alabama, and uh, end up going to the uh, to the Packers, and I watched Bart's uh, 
techniques and fundamentals of the game and passing, uh, just a great mind as well. And uh, I found that uh, after being drafted by the Lions, I'm in the central division. I'm going to be playing against this guy a couple times a year. And uh, we, we go up to Green Bay, and uh, Barton M is just re- returning uh, in 67 as the uh, – Defending Super Bowl champions. The first one was in '66, and first play from scrimmage after starting him at one, the toss to receive the ball. The ball was kicked off and was down in the end zone. So they bring it out to the 20-yard line. First and ten. The star does a reverse pivot and gives the ball off in the middle to Elijah Pitts for three yards. Now it's second and seven, and the wide side of the field to the rookie from Jackson State. And Coach Lombardi, as well as Bart, used to always test and pick on rookies. So Starr does a three-step drop, and he tries to throw an all, uh, a quick out to all pro boy dollar. And as he sees me closing, he somewhat was in the motion of throwing, so he throws the ball like a good fastball pitcher to a good fastball hitter. He throws it low and away, and I dive in the front of uh, the receiver about three and a half yards, and I stretch out and I intercept the ball, and I do a forward shoulder roll, and I get up and I run it into the end zone about 22 yards for a touchdown. And as I slammed the ball when I got into the end zone, I watched the ball go skyward. And I put my hands on my hips and I said, Lord, this is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> first play in the league, first pass, second play of the game, lines up 7 nothing. What was it like when you got inducted into the Hall of Fame? Oh, I'm still feeling that feeling, I tell you. Uh, one of the greatest feelings that uh, I can uh, always say, um, David, and uh, uh, I can always remember that because, I mean, it's a feeling like you, you, you never have a feeling like this before. I never had one before. I don't think playing in four or five uh, Super Bowls would have gave me that type of feeling. And uh, it, it was something that was, was totally unexpected, first of all, the uh, first year when I was on the uh, finalist list, uh, uh, I didn't think I was going to have a chance to go in, and then the next year I'm on the finalist list again, and uh, it happened that second time, second time around, and uh, it was news across the country, uh, Al Davis from the Raiders, uh, he had uh, John Mackey from the uh, Baltimore coach, may his soul rest in peace. And then we had number 44 from the Washington Redskins, John Riggins, and uh, myself. And, I mean, it was just uh, so un- unbelievable because, I mean, you know, again, uh, coming out of Jackson State, uh, Gulf Fort, Mississippi, uh, playing with the Lions, I mean, I'm thinking that you have to be two-time Super Bowl MVP or things of that nature to get in, but... I guess the second time around, it was good enough for the uh, for the writers and the voters, and found myself going down, and it was just one of those things that I was so appreciative over. And again, I got Jimmy David, uh, my uh, professional football coach, uh, to enshrine me. I had coaches from high school, coaches from college that I could ask, friends, uh, teammates. Uh, it was a lot of things, but it was. Uh, Jimmy David that I'd asked to do it, and the day of the parade uh, before the enshrinement, uh, I was asking my driver. I asked Spino. I said, Spino. He said, Yeah. What is the limb? I said, Has anybody ever sang at the uh, Hall of Fame enshrinement? He said, Oh yeah, they sing the national anthem and things like that. I said, Oh no, no. My daughter's going to do that. I said, What about any of the enshrinees? Have they ever sang before? He said. And trying, no, man, no, and trying to have ever sang before. He said, Why are you thinking about singing? I said, Well, if I can muster up to it, I, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And he said, What are you going to sing? I said, No, I can't tell you that. Now, I'm just going to let everybody know if I sing. So, <laughs> when Jimmy and trying to, my coach Jimmy David made his last few remarks about me, he says, And Lynn Barney, if there's ever a greater defensive back other than him that played in the National Football League, I've yet to see him. Here he is, Lynn Barney. So everybody start applauding, and I walk up and I give a little sigh, and I look out and I say, "For once in a lifetime, 
a man knows the moment. One wonderful moment when fate takes his hand. And this is my moment. Greatest moment of my life in football. So I had to sing about it or shout about it or I was going to cry. One of the three or four. But I uh, ended up singing and uh, it, it, it came off good. I mean, it, I didn't get any music offers or anything of that nature, but it was something I really wanted to do. And I said, if I ever get there, it's going to happen. So it happened. Was there one receiver you went up against who was, you know, the most challenging out there? What was the question again? Who, who was the toughest receiver that you went up against? Uh, it could have been a fat lady uh, in the front of me, and I was going to respect her because if she was in the front of me, she had the abilities uh, and the talents to beat me. But uh, learning differential uh, aspects of receivers there were some small receivers that had speed and could run uh, smooth patterns. Paul Warfield, uh, for instance. Uh, big receivers, Otis Taylor, Charlie Taylor, uh, speed and quickness and moves. And so learning by watching film, studying film, of what assets receivers had was one of my main uh, objectives, is to find out what they liked to do and crucial situations. So, again, I respected everybody who lined up in front of me on, on a game game day and uh, had always the ideology that if he's starting in the league, he has a chance to beat me. Or by studying film and practicing as hard as I would, uh, I had the chance uh, as well as he did when the ball was thrown in his area. So I respected everybody. Uh, again, you had guys like Cliff Branch who had – Great speed. Bob Hayes had great speed. Uh, weren't good route runners. But you go back again to a Paul Warfield, uh, Isaac Curtis, uh, who would run good routes that had great speed. Uh, Otis Taylor again. Otis had great speed as well as uh, a fine route runner. So those were the things that I would watch uh, when studying film on wide receivers. Uh, just not what route he ran, but how he did it and how he got in, into it and what's one of the favorites. So uh, I respected everybody. I really did. Uh, and I'm not trying to avoid the the uh, question that was asked, uh, if it was an elephant or a fat lady singing the blues <laughs> lined up in front of me on Sunday. She had a chance to beat me. All righty. Another wonderful show is available on podcast on TalkZone.com, Sports and Torts. I'd like to thank our guest, the lovely... Lariah Daniels and Lem Barney and I'd like to thank our executive producer Dave Olson and maybe one of these weeks we'll get David Spada back in the studio until then thank you again for tuning in we'll be back next week with sports and torts on talkzone.com <laughs>